Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the Building mRNA Victoria Capability webinar co-hosted by Invest Victoria and mRNA Victoria. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are individually meeting and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today, we bring together expert speakers to discuss Victoria's mRNA and biomedical capabilities. And we'll also hear from mRNA Victoria on its newly announced funding programs. I'm particularly pleased to open today's session after the announcement on Tuesday this week that the Victorian government has reached an in principle agreement with the Australian government and Moderna for Moderna to establish a new manufacturing and finish facility in Victoria. I'd like to also introduce myself. I'm Danny Jarrett, CEO for Invest Victoria. And joining us for today's session, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Amanda Caples, Victoria's lead scientist and director of Breakthrough Victoria, Professor Colin Putin, Professor of Pharmaceutical Bio Biology at Monash Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Mr. Daniel Bisignano, Chief Investment Officer for mRNA Victoria, and Ms. Rebecca Skinner, Director of Research and Industry Development at mRNA Victoria. Emerging and growth sectors in the digital technology space, particularly medical technology, are central to the future growth of Victoria's economy. Victoria has built a thriving, globally competitive health and medical research system through sustained investment in science and research infrastructure, skills and product development, and commercialization capabilities. The impact of the Victorian government's strategic investments has created jobs, attracted further investment, generated exports, delivered better healthcare, and more recently has enabled a rapid response to the global pandemic. Investing in sectors such as medical research will be critical to our econ economic recovery, and this forms part of our international investment strategy. A range of in initiatives to support the sector were announced by the Victorian government, including the $2 billion Breakthrough Victoria Fund, which will ensure Victoria continues to lead in research and innovation, creating highly skilled, high paying jobs. Where there is an opportunity and an immediate need, we also look at fast tracking beneficial investment projects. We have invested $80 million in the International Investment Attraction Fund to secure new investments that foster innovation and deliver spill, spillover benefits. And we continued working with investors to help them land in Victoria, despite the challenges of the pandemic. The $50 million research and development cash flow loans initiative is helping Victorian small to medium enterprises. We've seen strong interest in this initiative, which is addressing a short term gap to help business continue to innovate throughout and beyond the pandemic. And our $25 million venture growth fund will provide debt financing to help startups and scale ups get the kickstart they need and strengthen our entrepreneurial culture. As we tune in today from across the globe in Australia, I'd like to paint a picture of Melbourne and why it's the ideal destination to invest in developing and growing digital health opportunities right here. We have the intrinsic market strength and fundamentals with a capacity to grow. We have a growing demand for telehealth, remote monitoring, symptom checkers, and triage tools. And we have a large and innovative startup ecosystem. And we have well-established connections and partnerships between hospitals, higher education, and research organizations. As a national leader in biotechnology and Australia's largest exporter of pharmaceutical products, Victoria has strong capabilities in drug development, clinical trials, health product manufacturing and medical devices and digital health. The state boasts world-class clinicians and researchers supported by infrastructure at leading universities and research institutes. We are home to globally renowned medical research institutes, including the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research, Burnett Institute, Bio21 Institute, the Doherty Institute and the Flora Institute. Teaching hospitals, including Alfred Health, Peter McCallum Cancer Centre, Austin Health, Western Health, and our soon to be opened Victorian Heart Hospital, as well as world class universities, including the University of Melbourne, Monash University, and RMIT University. 
Our expertise and global reach is extensive. Investing in health and life sciences is a key priority set out in Victorian international investment strategy. Invest Victoria is the state government's leading investment attraction agency. And our role is to facilitate inbound investment attraction and be the point of coordination for international companies who are seeking new investment or reinvestment opportunities in Victoria. With 23 international offices around the world, the Victorian government's trade and investment network is the largest government trade and investment network in Australia. Our team are on the ground, connected and ready to open doors for your business, covering the Americas, Greater China, India, Japan, Korea, the Middle East, Africa and Turkey, Southeast Asia, and the UK and Europe. This demonstrates the significance of our investment and trade relationship and the strength of our people to people links and institutional ties globally. Harnessing our strengths, we will continue working closely with mRNA Victoria to develop the sector and attract investments to Victoria. Together, we are seizing the moment to shape our future and attract the best innovators to Victoria by creating the right setting for research, commercialization and innovative businesses. As we look ahead at the opportunities that the sector will present, new technologies are a vital part of Victoria's future in initiatives and policies. Innovation is going to underpin Victoria's economic growth and drive the creation of new and exciting jobs. Our door rem remains open for all business. For companies and investors looking to operate in a dynamic and innovative marketplace, Melbourne welcomes you. As you look towards expanding your focus in Australia, I hope you will find the following session insightful. Thank you, and I'll now hand over to Dan. Great, thanks, Danny, and uh, thanks for Invest Victoria for making today's webinar possible. And thanks to everyone who's uh, taken time out of their morning to learn about uh, the Victorian government strategy to develop um, a world-class mRNA industry in the state. So I think we have almost 190 people. So um, there's obviously some interest and we're incredibly excited about um, the journey that we're on. So I'm Daniel Bisignano, uh, mRNA uh, Victoria's Chief Investment Officer. I'll just provide a very, very quick overview of today's session and provide an introduction. We have uh, far more interesting speakers than myself to get to. Um, our first speaker, Dr. Amanda Caples, is Victoria's lead scientist um, and also chair of the uh, mRNA Victoria Scientific Advisory Board. Um, she'll speak briefly about uh, the Victorian uh, biomedical ecosystem, the investment the Victorian government's made over many, many decades um, uh, that really make the state a logical place um, to build the nation and the regions um, uh, leading mRNA manufacturing and research hub and ecosystem. Uh, sorry, could I get the next slide up, please? My colleague, Rebecca Skinner, who heads up uh, research and industry development at mRNA Victoria, will then outline the significant $23 million uh, investment that the Victorian government announced uh, late last week um, to really take great RNA-based uh, research out of the lab and into the clinic and support the next generation of um, RNA medical products. And finally, Professor Colin Powton will speak about the amazing work him and his colleagues are doing uh, to produce Australia's first uh, mRNA COVID-19 vaccine candidate. So before we begin, just a couple of small housekeeping items. Um, as you might have uh, heard earlier, Today's session is being recorded. Um, also, there'll be opportunities for Q&A at the end. Um, so I encourage any questions that you have, um, put them in the Q&A function. Um, so not the chat box, but the Q&A function. Um, and then we'll moderate that and get the speakers to respond to those at the, uh, the end of the session. So as is kind of outlined here, and uh, for the Australian audience, uh, the US dollar figures there are really, um, we're, we're having many people kind of dial in from around the world today. So just to provide a bit of a, a common uh, denominator, but over many, many years um, and decades, in fact, the Victorian government's invested enormous amounts um, in our health system. Um, in addition to the $15 billion that the Victorian and the Commonwealth government has gone into medical research. And we continue to invest um, in innovative technology development through initiatives like the, uh, the Breakthrough Victoria Fund. And in May this year, the Victorian government announced the creation of mRNA Victoria. Um, 
And our mission was very much to build um, an end-to-end -end mRNA research and manufacturing ecosystem. So we're supported by a scientific advisory board um, comprising of some of the country and indeed the world's best minds in infectious diseases, immunology and pharmaceutical manufacturing. Uh, next slide, please. So with the emergence of mRNA um, in the recent uh, pandemic as a revolutionary new technology, really the next step and the next evolution in medicine, we're looking to build upon Victoria's deep capabilities in pharmaceutical manufacturing, research, clinical capabilities, the infrastructure that we have in the state, um, and really move into the medicine's next frontier. Um, and so you can see here from just a, a quick kind of uh, uh, logo map, um, the, the depth of capability that we have in Victoria. Um, and I'm happy to actually see many of the representative of these organizations that are outlined here um, uh, are attending today. Next slide, please. So our strategy is threefold. Um, so we've recognized that we've got deep RNA research um, capabilities in the state. Um, so what we'll look to do initially is look to identify and fund the most promising RNA therapeutic uh, innovations. And that's very much the focus of the uh, webinar today. But secondly, to make sure that IP um, that we support um, and is supported by others in, in the private sector, is able to move from the lab into the clinic um, and have that occur in the state will ensure that we build the capacity locally um, to manufacture clinical and commercial scale RNA products. And finally, recognizing that mRNA is really a new and rapidly developing, evolving technology. We're working with companies from all over the world and Danny mentioned uh, Moderna earlier. Um, as an example, but we're working with companies from all over the globe um, to bring the latest innovations and capabilities into the state. Next slide, please. So for local and international companies, um, you know, there are three major things that we look to do. We, we help companies um, and universities and research organizations facilitate research partnerships. Um, on the more practical side, we help companies with supply chain development, site selection, regulatory compliance, um, and then we provide support and funding um, for new investment and research and development. So I'll leave my comments at that. That's a little bit of a quick overview of um, what our ambitions and, um, uh, and what we're seeking to achieve over the next, uh, over the next decade is this very, very interesting um, uh, medical development begins to develop. So I hope you find today's session valuable um, and I'd like to hand over to uh, Victoria's lead scientist, uh, Dr. Miranda Caples. Thanks very much, uh, Dan, and I'd like to extend um, my welcome and thank you to all of us jo joining us here today to learn about mRNA Victoria and what it means for researchers, for clinicians, for the people of Victoria, Australia and the world. If I could have uh, the next slide, please. So uh, I think as you've heard uh, from Dan and, and from Danny, uh, Victoria has built a globally competitive health and medical research system over the past 20 years. This makes Melbourne the Boston of the Southern Hem Hemisphere. And this hasn't happened by accident. Starting in 2001, the Victorian government embarked on a substantial multi-billion dollar program of investment in science and research capability. The report featured here, Creating a Healthy Future, was released earlier this year and you can find it online. And it tells the story of what we did and how we went about it. Importantly, it describes the impact of these investments in economic terms and how this investment has helped us deal with the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Creating a healthy future describes how we have invested in four areas, discovery research, research platform technologies, product development and commercialization, and industry and academic networks. So this is intentional design to create a functional world-class ecosystem. It reflects the fact that we recognize that excellence in science is at the heart of a vibrant biotechnology industry. And of course, this investment has led to and, and caught the attention of international technology companies who have chosen to invest and base their operations here uh, in Melbourne. And of course, 
this week, there is no greater example of how this uh, has this strategy has worked. As we have seen, Moderna and the Australian government choosing Victoria as the place to establish a commercial mRNA manufacturing facility for the Asia Pacific region. The Moderna facility will have capacity to produce 25 million mRNA vaccines a year from 2024 and up to 100 million doses a year if needed in the future. It will open the door to other global companies and, research and researchers establishing a regional base here in Melbourne to enjoy Victoria's robust health and medical research ecosystem. So this investment continues and we'll hear uh, later, um, in fact, after me, the uh, grant programs that we currently have open, some of which are closing soon, that enable us to, to deliver further on our commitment to grow a mRNA ecosystem here in Victoria to fulfil the promise that this exciting technology brings to public health and global health more broadly. If I could have the next slide, please. So my role, as uh, Dan has mentioned, is uh, to work with mRNA Victoria and, um, and lead the science advisory group. So just to recap, mRNA Victoria is the lead agency responsible for positioning Victoria as the Asia Pacific leader in mRNA research and production. And we are delivering this by securing a, a sovereign manufacturing capability, job done, uh, announced this week, growing RNA uh, research and development capability, and this will be done through the grants that Rebecca Skinner will uh, outline uh, after me. It's about supporting an internationally competitive broad-based mRNA therapeutic sector. And this will occur across Australia and through broader engagement across global centers of excellence that are establishing to, um, to create a network of capability that can rapidly respond to pandemics, but also to bring on the other therapeutic uh, uh, opportunities that mRNA platform uh, promises. So the mRNA Victoria team is advised by a scientific advisory group made up of world leading experts from across our community. The scientific advisory group provides expertise across the spectrum, including RNA biology, infectious diseases, immunology, clinical epidemiology, cancer and pharmaceutics. And I think it illustrates the depth of exp expertise we have here in Melbourne. And if I could have the next slide, please. So I'm the chair uh, of this group, which is a great honour because uh, just looking at the representatives on, on the board, you'll see that we have the outstanding infectious diseases leader here in Melbourne, Professor Sharon Lewin, the director of the Doherty Institute, along with Professor Brendan Crabb, the director of the Burnett Institute, and a range of other leaders across our medical research community from our medical research institutes and of course from our um, uh, leading biomedical universities, the University of Melbourne and Monash University. And it's fantastic that we have been joined by Dr. Barney Graham, the, the former deputy director of the Vaccine Research Center at the US National Institutes of Health. And for those of you familiar with this field, you'll know that Dr. Barney Graham has um, been recognized for his contribution in, in terms of the Moderna vaccine, which uh, we enjoy today. So one of our first investment uh, decisions um, made by the Scientific Advisory Board was to invest in Australia's first locally produced mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, which will go into clinical trials early in the new year. And Professor Palton will tell you more about this later in the webinar. If I could have the next slide, please. So one of the reasons we've been able to move so quickly is that Victoria has extensive clinical trial capabilities. And there are many good reasons to undertake clinical trials in Australia. Early phase clinical trials are 48% less expensive in Australia compared to the US and 60% cheaper after tax incentives are taken into account. 
The timeline for preparing documents for clinical trial applications is one month for Australia versus two to three months in the US. Australian clinical uh, trial data and results are accepted by international regulatory agencies, including the US Food and Drug Administration and the European Medicines Agency. And most importantly, we have a reputation for hospital trial facilities co-located with the research uh, expertise that we've talked about. And this enables accelerated development driven by insights from the clinical investigators. So it's no wonder that Victoria is the destination of choice in Australia for leading global pharmaceutical and biotech companies. And Moderna is the latest example of uh, that industry recognising Victoria for its long-term investment and commitment to health and medical research and the biotechnology industry. So in conclusion, we all know that mRNA is a game-changing medical science platform. It's amazing to think less than two years into this epidemic that we have had essentially a 12 months uh, clinical trial data and real life data of an mRNA vaccine that is delivering important outcomes in terms of prevention of hospitalization and really underpinning the recovery uh, of, uh, from this um, pandemic. Beyond coronavirus, of course, mRNA technology holds the potential to treat other unmet uh, medical needs ranging from heart disease, cancer, rare genetic conditions, as well as providing vaccines for other uh, viruses which have long evaded control, such as Zika, HIV and Epstein-Barr virus. Together with the Victorian government's investment and leadership, there is enormous potential that the next big mRNA breakthrough will come from Victoria. We invite you to join with us in achieving this endeavour. And uh, I'd like to thank you again uh, for attending this webinar. And now I'll ask Rebecca Skinner uh, to talk about the mRNA Victoria uh, grant programs. Thank you. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. I think we're up to nearly 200 participants. So great you could all join us today to hear about mRNA Victoria and I'm going to talk about two grant programs. So my name is Rebecca Skinner and I'm the Director of Research Industry Development at mRNA Victoria. Uh, the role of my team is to really, as Amanda described, grow the local um, RNA ecosystem, focusing on research, research translation, all the way through to working with local industry and manufacturers. And our work is really guided by um, Dr Amanda Caples um, as Chair of our, our Scientific Advisory Group. So as you've heard from Dan and Amanda, part of our um, mandate is to grow capability in the state for RNA technologies. This is why we're supporting the sector from discovery research all the way through to platform capabilities and technologies that support RNA manufacturing and the broader supporting supply chains with two grant programs. Um, as we've already talked about, pop your questions in the Q&A section as we go um, and we can answer them or um, answer them verbally afterwards or please visit our website which has all of the guidelines and FAQs. Uh, next slide please. So mRNA Victoria has just launched two competitive funding programs and they are both now open for applications. These are the mRNA Victoria Research Acceleration Fund and the mRNA Victoria Activation Program or MAP as we like to call it. I'm going to talk briefly about the Acceleration Fund um, because um, applications close at one minute to midnight tomorrow night. So I hope all of you listening who are planning to apply are you know, nearly done with the applications and ready to hit the um, submit button. If not, we may um, announce a second round next year subject to approvals. So um, that will be good news and sign up to our website newsletter uh, for more information on that as it comes about. So the Acceleration Fund is designed to capitalise on Victoria's comparative advantages in research and increase the RNA candidate pipeline. This round, we are providing 2 million total of grants uh, to support and accelerate RNA-based therapeutics uh, research through provision of one-off grants to successful applicants. 
And these grants will be delivered across two tiers. Uh, tier one are smaller grants, $100,000 to support innovative early stage RNA based therapeutics research. And we hope this will bring health and economic benefits to the state. The tier two grants are a bit bigger, uh, grants up to $500,000. Um, these are aimed more at research translation to accelerate um, translation into the clinic, into therapeutics. Um, one of the key features of the Acceleration Fund is that grant funding must be matched by the applicant's organisation and collaboration is a mandatory criteria. Um, and we really hope that in the long term, this program will increase the capability, knowledge and expertise across the um, RNA sector, attract investors to the state um, and to collaborate with these researchers. If you are interested um, in the Acceleration Fund but might miss out, as I mentioned, we are hoping for a new, um, a new round next year. So sign up to the newsletter and keep an eye out. Our next, our next program is the MAP program or the Victorian Activation Program. We only launched this to, um, last Friday on 10 December and this is closing in mid-January. So a bit of Christmas homework out there for everyone. This is a larger funding pool with about 21 million available to provide support for projects across research, development, commercialization, and manufacturing. It's quite different to the acceleration fund. Um, funding amounts are not specified and there are no mandatory requirements for co-contributions or collaboration. However, projects with co-contributions and collaboration will be highly competitive and highly regarded. Um, in terms of grant size, as I said, we've left that silent, but we really, really want realistic and good innovative applicants. Overall MAP is a broad program looking to support strong ideas to grow Victoria's capability in RNA research. Um, and we really want to create a viable end-to-end -end ecosystem for produ producing world-leading RNA-based you know, medical products. Um, I'm not going to go through in detail the priority areas for MAP. Um, just, I'll just do that at a high level. But I just want to say, whilst we have priority areas, the project or the program isn't limited to these. So if you have a really good innovative project, don't be dissuaded from applying if it doesn't fit with one of these priority areas we have listed. Um, and through MAP, we're really aiming to grow um, not just for the local industry, but we're looking at... Um, collaborative ecosystem solutions for problems faced by the Asia Pacific region and Australia as well. Um, so it's a big focus for us. We know it's a big focus of lots of our infectious diseases research here in the state as well. So MAP is actually broken down into two um, streams. Um, you can see these accelerating translation stream. It's a little bit confusingly named um, given our other program and the um, uh, supporting the pipeline stream as well. Now, just note here that MAP applications will be in two stages. The first round, those due in mid-January, are an EOI. They will be assessed, and those we assessed as competitive will be invited for a full application. And I'll talk about timelines in a bit. Next slide, please. So I'll talk first quickly about the accelerating translation stream. This is really um, directed at supporting projects which are focused on building platform or foundational capabilities to enable the acceleration of early stage discoveries into viable and effective products. There are some priority themes under this stream, as I mentioned a minute ago, and we're really hoping to receive applications which focus on areas such as next generation manufacturing technologies, software tools for in silico research or product design, safety testing um, and enhanced or alternate um, RNA delivery. Next slide, please. The supporting the pipeline stream is actually focused on projects um, to progress the development of new and novel RNA therapeutics or enhance existing RNA-based therapeutics or vaccines. And we are, of course, looking at COVID, but also well beyond COVID, um, products, you know, spanning obviously vaccines, infectious diseases, oncology, rare diseases, and as I mentioned, those priority areas for the Asia-Pacific region. 
And we're also interested in projects that enable technologies such as dose re reduction, such as self-amplifying RNA. Um, again, not limited to what I've just described, we're really aiming for outcomes to um, improve the cost efficiency of RNA, accelerate or optimize discovery, um, and improve manufacturing outputs like quality uh, and safety. Um, and of course, a range of RNA-based therapeutic candidates. So we have a big, diverse and growing pipeline. I'll just note here on the slide, and Amanda mentioned this already, we're gonna hear from Professor Colin Powton in a moment. Um, and this is a great case study of a grant already provided by mRNA Victoria under a strategic grant program. But it's a great case study for the types of innovative collaborative, collaborative projects we would like to see more of. So um, this was a collaboration between um, Monash School of Pharmacy or Institute for Pharmaceutical Sciences, the Doherty and um, local manufacturer IDT to develop and then manufacture a local mRNA candidate for clinical trials. And Professor Powton will discuss this with you in a moment, but it's a really exciting project. Next slide, please. Just gonna to touch on eligibility here because these are um, very common uh, questions. Um, both programs, um, Acceleration Fund and MAP, require the lead applicant or applicant organization to hold an Australian business number. Um, but that's that we really do welcome interstate and overseas applicants and collaborators. Um, if they hold, they can be the lead applicant if they hold that ABN. If not, they can be a partner or collaborator. But there is a requirement that projects are predominantly led from and conducted in Victoria. Um, I really strongly encourage you to review the guidelines, which outline all of the requirements. Um, they're all on our website. Um, and applications are welcome from industry and the research community. And as I mentioned, um, whilst not a requirement for MAP, applications with collaboration, collaborators and um, funding code contributions will be the most competitive. Um, government is also committed to creating opportunities for women in these grants as well, and um, applications which feature um, you know, um, participation inclusion will also be competitive. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is the final slide. We're just going to talk quickly about timelines for MAP. Uh, Acceleration Fund, of course, closes tomorrow night. For MAP, um, uh, grant the EOI process um, closes on the 19th of January, also at one minute to midnight. Um, and well, then we anticipate there'll be a six week uh, assessment period after which the successful EOIs will be invited to submit a full application um, and then we have a four week and a six week uh, timeline as well. So again, all on our website, all in the guidelines, um, pop your questions in the Q&A, the FAQs on our website um, and best of luck to anyone who wishes to submit an application and thank you. I think I'm handing over to Professor Powton. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, can I have a first slide? Yeah, so I'm a pharmaceutical scientist from Monash Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, we call MIPS, and um, working on mRNA delivery for a number of years now. And when COVID came along, it was obvious to us we should get involved and try and make a COVID vaccine. And so we did that and started doing preclinical work, um, designing the mRNA, injecting the candidates into mice and then we collected the serum and shipped it across the road to our friends at the Doherty Institute who were able to uh, analyze the immunological responses in terms of um, neutralization antibodies that can neutralize virus infection. So since then it's been a strong partnership with the Doherty Institute to take this vaccine forward but we reached a point where we really weren't able to take it into the clinical trial because to make a product in a manufacturing environment costs money and also we have to engage with a group who are able to do this. So we were delighted in the middle of this year to receive some funding from mRNA Victoria to do exactly that and 
As a pharmaceutical scientist, I was very confident that our local manufacturers could do this. Whilst they weren't familiar with mRNA technology, we know enough about this technology to know that it's within the scope of most pharmaceutical manufacturers, given time and funds to actually achieve the end point. Um, often the skills around pharmaceutical manufacturing are fairly generic in the sense that it's about understanding the requirements to make a safe product and to ensure the quality of the product for human use. And I was always confident that we could translate our laboratory work into a pharmaceutical product, given enough funding. And, and that's exactly what we've been doing over the last few months. So on the slide, you can see a picture of the IDT facility, which is a contract manufacturer in the east of Melbourne. And my team worked with the IDT team to produce the vaccine, not without technical challenges. There were some technical challenges to overcome, which is interesting and rather fascinating. But it's a very rewarding experience for my team and for IDT to, to sort of take our products, which were essentially research products for preclinical use, into a product which is fit for human use. So uh, my team there in the preclinical group, Harry, Stewart and Ruby have been working for six months in collaboration with our Doty colleagues. But in the last few months, we've recruited a number of my PhD students and friends around the department to really engage with IDT and produce tests and help translate the laboratory product into a pharmaceutical product. And working with the IDT team has been rewarding and interesting and knowledge gaining for both my group, but also for the IDT group in learning about mRNA vaccine manufacture. I think the interesting thing about this is that really from a pharmaceutical perspective, once you understand what's involved in making mRNA products, they're not really any more challenging than, for example, making a protein and are probably from a quality point of view, less challenging than making a viral product. So hence, I was always very confident that we could do this. Let me, let's take to the next slide and I'll tell you a little bit about more what's involved in this. So you can break down manufacture of mRNA products into three principal steps. Obviously the, the sequence itself is designed first, but when you get into a production environment, you've got to amplify the sequence of DNA that you've used, we call that a DNA template, you've got to amplify that template up in preparation for making RNA by in vitro transcription, an enzymatic process, cell-free process. Um, and those two steps produce very clean DNA and also very clean RNA. And so from a pharmaceutical perspective, these materials are more like drugs to me more like drugs than say a product which is produced in a cell-based manufacturing environment. These are products that can be purified and they can be purified and frozen. So you can purify the DNA, freeze it, ship it somewhere else. You can make the RNA, you can purify that, freeze it, ship it somewhere else. And then you have to assemble the product into a formulated form. And the formulation for, at the moment, that most groups are using for RNA is the lipid nanoparticle, sort of shown schematically on the right. So that process is actually broken down into three different steps, even in the BioNTech Pfizer manufacturing process. In fact, they ship the individual components around the world. So from step two, making mRNA, they ship a product to Europe to assemble some of the products for distribution in Europe. So how have we gone about this locally? We've made the DNA actually at MIPS. You don't need very much DNA to make the mRNA for a phase one clinical trial. Now at the moment, there hasn't been up to now a pharmaceutical manufacturer in Australia that is capable of making a GMP mRNA product. So we did that part of the process for this particular immediate need for a COVID vaccine. We did that in a manufacturer in Belgium under contract, a manufacturer that is used to making 
mRNA for clinical use. We then ship that back frozen and IDT were involved in step three, which is really the pharmaceutical manufacturing part, if you like, turning it into a formulated form um, and then going through the process of filtering the product, putting it into vials, but then more importantly, going through all the quality assessments to make sure that the product is um, what we think it is and it's fit for human use. And so that was the product which, that was the step, step three, where we've been engaging for the last few months with IDT very sort of successfully. To do that, we've um, used the mRNA Victoria grant in a number of ways. We've certainly had to uh, contract the Belgian company to make mRNA, but the, the majority of the funding went towards making the product with IDT. And one of the things we had to do to do that is to bring in some equipment. So IDT, whilst they have the pharmaceutical knowledge, they didn't have the equipment to actually make this product immediately. And that's, that's a kind of um, a gap in, in Australia right now where not enough manufacturers can actually produce a product because they don't have the equipment, they don't necessarily have the analytical equipment to essentially scale up from our laboratory scale to um, a product fit for human use. So I think it's, um, it's been a, a really fascinating journey and a very rewarding one and without the mRNA Victoria funding, it would not have been possible to make a product which we hope is going to go into clinical trial in the new year. I think it's important to say that in the laboratory, we've been making mRNA products for several years and have made over 80 different mRNA products for use in the laboratory and in animal studies for various uses. But making a pharmaceutical product for human use is a whole different ball game. And uh, we couldn't do that within the university environment, obviously. And having this funding from mRNA Victoria has allowed us to work with a local manufacturer to get to that point. And I think um, it's been a, a really important step for Victoria. It does also mean that we now have a local CMO that can do this. And at the moment, the equipment is sitting there and waiting in case other groups want to go in and make an mRNA product. So exactly how this will develop in the future obviously depends on a number of factors and funding and so on, but we certainly hope that um, this is the start of many products made within Victoria for clinical use. So um, I'll stop there and answer any questions. Great, thanks Colin. Um, I might uh, actually go through a lot of the questions that have been uh, put into the chat box um, and I just encourage anyone, I'm gonna do it in order of uh, voting. Um, so if you've got a particular question that you wanna kind of uh, put a bet behind, um, feel free to kind of uh, uh, up vote that particular question. Um, but the one at the top of the pops at the moment um, is from Chen. Um, and so I might direct this one to Rebecca, who's managing the grant program. So uh, Chen asks, how many or how much uh, uh, funds do you plan to invest in blue sky research into RNA biology? Um, so he makes the comment that uh, for a sustainable and innovative RNA ecosystem um, that is required. So maybe Beck, if you could address that question. Yeah, sure. Look, uh, great question, Chen. And um, I, we have obviously $2 million for the acceleration fund, which may not sound like a huge amount of money, but that really is for that early stage research. And I hope you've uh, got a competitive grant put in for that program. Um, we have $21 million for the MAP program. We do not have a specific breakdown of what's going to go to early stage research versus a manufacturing project. We are really looking at what are good innovative projects which will grow the RNA industry here in Victoria. Um, and of course, we know the Commonwealth have got quite a few programs and funding um, initiatives in this area um, to support early stage research, but also RNA research as well, which complements our programs. Great. Um, 
you might want to keep your mic off or on, Beck, because I can see a lot more really about the mechanics of how these grant programs work, um, which is great um, to have a lot of interest. Um, and I'll try to get through as many of these questions as possible. So, um, so Stuart has asked uh, if you can provide uh, just a little bit of information about how the grants will be assessed. Yep, great question, Stuart. Um, we have uh, both uh, scientific experts assessing the grants as well as internal to government um, experts. We look at grants for both their contribution to research, but also industry. And our scientific advisory group, which Amanda talked about, has a really key role as well in overseeing these grants programs. Great, thanks. Um, now, Damien's asked, uh, given that there's been a number of federal government industry-focused funding schemes, um, things like the MMI, and many of these are still under review, um, can applications for MAP uh, and the Accelerator um, program uh, be projects that have already been proposed under these programs ahead of the outcomes? Yeah, it's a great question. And some of the timelines for these projects is tricky. Um, they, Renee, my colleague, will jump in if I get this wrong. I do not believe they're excluded and you're welcome to submit them as part of our program as well. I just will note, though, that some of the Commonwealth programs like MMI have a much larger budget allocation than what we have for MAP. So just in terms of scale and quantum there. That said, we haven't got an a upper or lower limit on grant applications for this program. We really want your best innovative projects put forward. Great. Um, now, V has asked uh, just how much of the $23 million um, in the two combined grant programs will be allocated uh, in the first round? Okay, so the acceleration fund, the $2 million will be allocated uh, in this round. MAP is a little bit more open to um, the quality and um, of the applicants and the uh, volume of applicants. I expect we're going to get a large number of really high quality applications because we have such an amazing uh, community here in Victoria. Um, but there is no specific detail on that at this stage. So again, put your best applications forward. Great. Uh, so Ned has asked uh, about the eligibility of Commonwealth agencies, in particular CSIRO, to apply. Look, that's possibly of an oversight in our guidelines. We will go back and double check that, but it's unlikely that CSIRO will be eligible as their Commonwealth funded entity. Can I just add in there, but CSIRO uh, researchers would be eligible to be part of a consortium. So, um, so, so that's, they're not eligible as being an applicant, but they can be a participant. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. That's a great point. And, and are welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Tim has asked, uh, does developing local mRNA manufacturing capability fit into MAP, um, given its focus is on uh, novel and new technologies? Absolutely, Tim. Uh, the first stream of MAP is all about manufacturing, partially about manufacturing technologies, and it actually fits with that, that theme there. Right. Um, now, Eric has asked about whether the MMI, uh, sorry, mRNA Victoria grants are AUD or USD, the AUD. Um, sorry, my, my fault for using US uh, dollar figures at the beginning to talk about the Victorian government's investment. However, that was to speak to a broader international audience, but no, there are Australian dollars. Um, so Stuart has asked uh, the alignment of the uh, NCRIS network um, uh, with uh, mRNA Victoria's uh, accelerating translation stream. Um, so he's mentioned you might want to take that offline, but any comments? Yes, Amanda has a comment. Uh, look, I think more broadly, and there's a general theme to the questions that are being asked, which is well understood. And, and I think as Rebecca described, what we're looking to do is to leverage. You know, we don't want to, uh, we don't need to reinvent any wheel. This is how can we bring together existing capability, add to the add to that capability so that we can accelerate and expand uh, the, the whole system. So 
NCRIS related facilities uh, again can be participants in these projects. Similarly, and whilst I, I've got the floor, so to speak, or to say, also to say that um, you know, Commonwealth programs, uh, other state programs. So there's a question there about interstate collaboration. Yes, we recognise that there is a huge amount of expertise outside of Victoria. So the key thing uh, for uh, our for consideration will be the, um, the the funding. We will want to primarily fund uh, Victorian-based activity, but that doesn't exclude interstate, particularly if interstate uh, players have um, matching funding of, uh, of of their own. So. What we're seeking to do is leverage up a great system of capability, uh, uh, you know, in Australia. Hopefully, that answers a couple of other questions along the way. Great, thanks, Amanda. Um, Sam has asked if uh, the program is solely focused on therapeutics. Um, or can RNA-based diagnostics point of care um, or improvement in current diagnostic methods be funded? That's a great, great question. Um, it's not just based on therapeutics. Obviously, we've talked about the wide, wider um, technology supporting manufacturing and supply chain. Diagnostics may or may not form part of that. So um, we'll probably take that question offline. It would depend on the nature of the application. But if you've got an application where a diagnostic really supports an RNA technology, um, you know, consider putting an application. Great. Um, now, Harry's question, I think we covered that earlier when we talked about how we'll be looking to um, assess technologies. So maybe I'll go to Callum's question about um, anticipated grant time length for the MAP program. Yeah, great question. Again, we don't have a specification on that, but grants will commence as soon as the grant agreement is executed with successful applicants, which we would hope they are executed by around May or June next year. Great. Um, so Kevin has an interesting question. I might answer this one. Mm. Um, uh, so all market leading suppliers of fill and finish equipment have lead times exceeding 24 months, uh, excluding validations of how we're going to produce 25 million doses in 2024. So I think this was uh, at the Prime Minister's press conference kind of mentioned. Um, I think uh, everyone recognises the challenges um, as the world kind of simultaneously ramps up to produce increased kind of vaccine capacity. Um, that said, the Victorian government strategy there is very much to partner with uh, the leading organisations in the world. Um, and this work has been underway for quite some time um, so that we hope that we can overcome those particular challenges. Um, suffice to say, uh, everyone recognises the, the urgency in actually moving quickly um, to achieve those ambitious timeline targets. Um, so... Given there's only a few minutes left, I might just uh, ask a couple more questions and maybe start to redirect it to some of the other panelists. So Serena, I noticed that you had a question for Colin. Um, so uh, she's interested in uh, your insights around the challenge of uh, assessing lipid formulation proprietary expertise, um, which seems to be a hurdle in a lot of the research in, uh, in RNA. Well, there's a lot of um, experience in companies in formulating RNA into lipid nanoparticles. There are also a lot of publications from uh, academic groups, but it's a complex area because there's a lot of IP associated with these formulations, both the formulations and the lipids themselves. So there's um, much interest around alternative formulations, what they might be and how active they are. And the problem is that I guess assessing these materials, uh, you need to get into an animal experiment and you need to get into an animal experiment where you can measure a biological effect. And that really hasn't been done with a sort of head to head comparison of different formulations to, to a very great extent, certainly not in terms of public information. 
So um, it certainly will have been done in the in the companies involved in this area, but obviously we don't have access to that data. So I think it's going to be important for academic groups to do those kind of head to head studies and really understand what are the limitations and why is everyone converging on LNP formulations right now and in, in within the LNP formulation itself, how much uh, capacity is there for change and if you like avoiding IP and having freedom to operate. These are big questions in the field right now. And I think everyone's very interested in them. Great. Thanks, Colin. Um, and given there's two minutes left, I'll just ask one last question. Sorry, Callum, you mentioned I skipped over your question. Um, I believe I asked that one, um, which was the anticipated grant length time for MAP program. Beck, did we answer that one earlier? So, great. Did, I think, did Callum have a second question though? I'm not sure. Keep going, Dan. Yep, that's okay. Um, and just one last question, um, maybe an easy one. Uh, does the program support early stage ASO therapeutic development? It's not excluded from the program. Right. Okay, thanks. Um, so given that we're almost on the hour, I might uh, close off the questions there, but suffice to say, any questions that we didn't answer uh, directly live, um, we'll endeavor to kind of provide written answers to. So we have um, your names and emails there. So um, they're not submitted in vain. Um, so just in closing, I'd like to one, again, thank Invest Victoria for organizing and hosting us uh, for today's webinar. I'd like to thank all the panelists, um, uh, Amanda, Rebecca, and Colin for giving up their time um, and explaining a little bit about um, how they're helping to, uh, I guess, build this ecosystem that the Victorian government's very uh, committed and keen to see uh, evolve in, in Victoria. Um, if you'd like to find out a little bit more information mRNA Victoria is doing um, or the grant programs that we've um, that we've released um, the email address is on screen um, for international companies that are dialing in or listening to this recording um, we have uh, contact details for Nathan Elia who's our uh, senior vice president of global business development there so I encourage you to contact him um, and for all investment kind of inquiries into Victoria, you see Invest Victoria's details at the bottom there. So um, again, I'd like to thank you all for, uh, for attending today and um, hope to cross paths soon. Thank you very much.